if you're a shitty black belt and you go roll with a blue belt and get you get tuned up, you're going to be exposed. You're going to know right away. You're going to have that immediate feedback um, in this sport. And that is one of the most beautiful things about jujitsu. The mats do not lie. What's the most efficient possible victory against this particular opponent? He's dropping off the choke here. We could see the finish. It's looking tight. Tight to Delper. Hey guys, what is up? Matt Kwan, the Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast. Welcome to the show. Remember, the Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast is everything you need to know about Jiu-Jitsu. And this week, we're going to be talking about how you can boost your confidence in Jiu-Jitsu. Before we do that, I'd like to ask you to like, share, so smash the subscribe button wherever you are. Leave comments in the comment section. Um, it really helps the algorithm. If you want to support the show, check the links in the bottom. Also, if you want some uh, Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast merchandise, like this sweet hat that I'm wearing, uh, check out the link in the bottom as well. It helps to support the show. It keeps the lights running. And guys, if you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the show. It really, really helps me out. Uh, support the things you like, otherwise they go away. All right, so uh, let's talk about confidence. What is confidence? It doesn't matter what you're trying to accomplish in life. Confidence is incredibly important. So when I think of confidence, I, th I just think about having a belief in oneself, okay? Believing that you, uh, that you can achieve something, that you have an ability or a skill, that you have potential to achieve something. Anytime you're trying to pursue any kind of venture in life, it's so important to have confidence. If you don't have confidence and you're trying to accomplish anything great, it's very likely that you're gonna fall short. Usually it leads to things like uh, quitting before you've actually given something a true attempt, like um, starting a business or whatever, you know, if you don't believe that you can actually carry through and complete the mission or uh, create something that's sustainable, a lot of the time you'll get a couple months in and then you'll just give up. All right. And um, you can't have that mindset if you're going to start any kind of a business. I just had Ben Wilson on the show last week and we're talking um, his po podcast, how to take over the world. We were talking about a lot of different topics. I really recommend you check out the show, but one of the episodes Ben Wilson has is about Walt Disney. And I really, really enjoyed that episode because Walt Disney was just like, um, a risk taker, super aggressive and, uh, a, a dreamer, someone who really followed his passion and he always wanted more. He always wanted to uh, conquer more. He always wanted to achieve the next thing, you know? And, um, <clears throat> if he didn't have that belief and that passion and that confidence in himself, then there's no way he would have accomplished the things that he would have had. Any great historical figure, has some degree of confidence in themselves and they have this energy, this hunger that allows them to, uh, to, for lack of a better term, take over the world. Again, check out Ben Wilson's how to take over the world. Amazing podcast. Really, really enjoyed having Ben on the show. Danaher talks about confidence as your results in the training room. You can build confidence by having successes in the training room and you can, in theory, take that confidence and translate it into a competition situation. Now, we're going to talk in this episode about how we can deal with things like nerves and how we can differentiate practice performance from competition performance. But it's really important to understand that if you're not having success in the training room, you're likely not going to be going into any competitions with confidence. You're not going to have the belief that you can um, win a competition. And there's really no way around that. That is, uh, jujitsu is, is a sport where we cannot hide. There is no lying on the mats. It's not like, you know, it's not like we're making, pa uh, we're not doing kata. We're not doing patterns and breaking boards. We're in there against someone who trains somewhere else, who is very dedicated to jujitsu jiu generally, and they're trying to fucking kill you. And it's really, really hard to hide against somebody like that. It's just going to be you and them on the mats. And that's going to determine who is, the more skilled fighter. So um, when you're going into a competition, having that confidence behind you is so much of being a good competitor. It's not just about who knows more moves or who's more effective. A lot of the time is who has the confidence, who, who believes that they're going to be able to win. And that will determine a lot of who will actually land the techniques that they're trying to get to. Um, I think it's important, you know, to look out for false confidence. Don't be that person who... <laughs> has been doing, you know, I'm going to shit on Japanese jiu-jitsu or Aikido and 
uh, other other traditional martial arts like this where, you know, essentially you're doing katas. You're not really doing live training. You're not doing randori training. And you don't have that self-awareness that, hey, I might not be as legit as I've been trained to believe. In jiu-jitsu, we can't really easily do that. Pretty quickly, you find out whether or not you're you're learning ju- uh, legit jiu-jitsu. Now, you could be in a club that kind of sucks and that club is isolated and therefore you don't get to cross train or see other people from other gyms. And so you've created this little ecosystem within your own gym where like, let's say not many people are good. And then you don't really know what else is out there. That is that is possible. But anyone who uh, steps into a competition, anyone who studies jujitsu, anyone who watches competitive jujitsu can tell generally, I would hope nowadays, uh, whether or not what they're doing is legit. So have that self-awareness like, you know, if you're at if you're at the gym and your your instructor is starting you on your knees, for example, um, both of you start on your knees or if your instructor is saying, hey, leg locks aren't jujitsu or things like that. Have the awareness that like um, jujitsu is moving so fast that we're kind of getting left behind. OK, and if we're not if we're not considering that we are getting left behind, then, um, you know, we're just not going to be up to date when it comes to actually being legit and there are people who want to uh who just want to go through their jujitsu journey at a family at a family gym where they're not getting pushed hard and they just want to come in and get a sweat and make friends that is true but i would i'm speaking on behalf of people who uh, are taking jujitsu seriously and they want to learn good jujitsu and it makes sense if you're going to commit decades of your life to this art why not try to make as much of an impact and and learn as good a jujitsu as you possibly can Another thing about jiu-jitsu is self-confidence is think about like judo or MMA. In judo or MMA, you could go in um, with uh, some some confidence. You're, 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 you have that false confidence, okay? You're, you, uh, or, or you don't have the false confidence. You're not aware of it and you're going into a competition thinking, yeah, I can knock this guy out. Yeah, I can throw this guy. <clears throat> but really, you don't know if, if you are um, capable of what you're doing. You may or may not be better than your opponent, but the thing is, in MMA and in, jiu- uh, in judo, one strike or one throw in the match is over. So your opponent could potentially be way better than you, and you're, um, but you have this ace up your sleeve that they haven't seen before, or maybe you step and they zig when they should have zagged and you knock them out. In these sports, the consequence of one movement can be the end of the match. Whereas in jiu-jitsu, it's, it doesn't really exist that uh, the sport doesn't really go in that way in jujitsu. A lot of the time your opponent has to dismantle you. And generally the better athlete will win, or I should say the better practitioner will win um, because there's so many steps that lead to uh, an eventual victory in jujitsu. It's not like I just throw someone and it's over. Okay. It's not like I can just like knock, have that one punch knockout in jujitsu. I got to take you down. I got to get on top. I got to pass the guard. Okay. So you could go into a a tournament with uh, false confidence in jujitsu. Generally, you can't really get away with that in other sports. It's, it's not likely that you'll be able to defeat someone who's more skilled than you on a regular basis, but it is possible in jujitsu. We don't have that one punch knockout. Um, I remember going into one of my first tournaments. I was a white belt. I was, I I started competing as a white belt, three stripes. And I believe this was my second tournament. My first tournament, I went in and I cleaned everyone out. I won my gi. I won my no gi division, got a couple submissions. I was like, man, I'm the shit. This is awesome. I go into my next tournament. I thought I was going to clean everyone out. My first match, I remember shooting in on a double and the guy actually pulled guard and arm barred me immediately. It was crazy. I've actually, um, I've actually never really seen an armbar like that. Even to this day, it was really, really cool the way he timed my takedown and just fell into a juji. And um, yeah, I remember just being dumbfounded after that and being like, man, holy shit, I can get submitted. I didn't get submitted often in training. I, I was like uh, pretty decent uh, right off, right off the bat when I was doing jujitsu, even as a white belt. And I, you know, I was having a lot of success in the training room. And I, I went into that competition. I got armbarred immediately and I was like, holy fuck, I, I, I guess anyone can get caught, right? That's like that one punch knockout. <clears throat> so I went in with this, this sort of uh, lack of self-awareness. I had this false confidence within me and it ended up costing me. I didn't really take my opponent seriously. I thought I was just going to run through him like I did in the first tournament that I went in. And uh, un- unfortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> but it was a good lesson for me to learn from. So confidence comes from success in the training room. This is what Danaher talks about a lot. Um, how do you create success in the training room? This is a, this is a question that I, I'm sure everyone would love to have the answer to. 
uh, spend lots of time in defensive cycles. I think that that's really, really important. Putting yourself into uh, pins and into submissions and have a uh, regularly feel that heat, especially if you're in a room where there are a lot of other people who uh, aren't very skilled. You're going to have to find a way to put yourself in bad positions because if you never feel those defensive cycles, then you're going to get tuned and went uh, in, in against good opponents. And when you go against those good opponents, it's going to be shocking. You're going to be like, whoa, why? Uh, I, I'm not used to feeling this pressure. I'm not used to being stuck in these positions. Normally, I'm on the um, I'm on the uh, I'm distributing the punishment and now I'm taking it and I'm unaccustomed to it. So make sure in training, you put yourself in defensive cycles, understand where those defensive cycles end and the offensive cycle can begin. Um, this is why Gordon and Danaher have started really talking about, even in their DVDs, uh, you know, talking about defensive cycles, talking about offensive cycles and specifically going through the concepts on escaping defensive cycles and going into offensive cycles. This is literally the, um, the theme of some of their instructionals. And it's so important to know that if I had known that throughout my early years of jujitsu, I think I would have been way more effective. Also, I think you should uh, gamify your training. Uh, even if your, your training partner doesn't know about it. So I, when I spoke to Kit Dale on this episode, he was talking about how, um, you know, he's one of the main purveyors of this gamified training, right? Mini games, task focused training. I know everyone, uh, it, it, the, is talking about how Greg Souter has kind of invented it, or he's sort of making it popularized, but, Actually, Kid Dale's been doing it for, you know, over 10 years, or, or, or I would say. And he he talked about how when he was training with his training partners, he wouldn't even, they weren't even playing games, but he would be playing a game within their sparring. So he would be just trying to focus on completing certain tasks. And if his partner passed his guard, he would basically like give up a submission just to go back into that situation where he's trying to retain his guard or he's trying to get an underhook or whatever. So he would gamify his own training without his partner even knowing. And you can do this. Just imagine you're going against someone and you uh, do all this work to get on top. You pass their guard, you mount them, and then you let them uh, recover back to a half guard. And then you try and do it again. And then he recovers, then you do it again. You're basically uh, talking about half guard camping and backtracking uh, from the mount to the half guard and then just sort of dominating that offensive cycle. And you can do this from any position, top or bottom. You can do this with your training partners without them even knowing about it. Uh, and they might even be like, hey, why aren't you just like fin uh, submitting me? What, you had me in mount. And you're like, uh, I don't know. I'm just just like working my passing game, working my backtracking and my camping. So you can, so you can set up your own training in this way to really maximize certain situations. And like I said, gamify your training with or without your partner even knowing. And remember to create success in the training room. Uh, mental study, often overlooked. I'm one of those people who believes in moves. I believe uh, instructionals are incredibly important. I believe that you can watch something and you can uh, you can recreate it or mimic it to some degree and reproduce that to the same effect in live training. Even a lot of the time, just by watching something, I can just reproduce it. And uh, th that mental study, thinking about jujitsu off the mats, taking extra time to put new information in your brain, that's, as Gordon says, some of the hardest training you can do. Anyone can go to the gym and roll hard. Not many people can sit down and watch, uh, you know, hours of tape day after day after day. It's more fun to train. It's more fun to just roll. But really applying your mind to jujitsu and questioning the way you're doing things and looking at the best coaches and athletes and seeing what they're doing and uh, trying to get those those little details that make all the difference. That is really, really difficult. And that is really uh, beneficial if you can if you have the tolerance to do so. Um, rolling in competition feels so different from rolling in the gym. Why is this? I really like how Danaher talks about on Lex Friedman's podcast about how um, competition is essentially an illusion. The lights, the crowd, the metals on the line. Um, it's, it's very easy to get caught up when you go to the gymnasium. A lot of time in jujitsu gyms are in uh, tournaments are in gymnasiums. Nowadays, like the bigger tournaments, they actually rent out uh, arenas. Okay. But the, it wasn't always like that. Even a couple of years ago, you know, Nogi Pans was in like a, a high school gymnasium. Um, but you go to these venues that you've never been in before and you're uh, you're out of your zone. You've never been there. It's uncomfortable. You don't know where things are. You don't know what the mats are going to feel like. You don't know what the layout is, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's people watching. <clears throat> There's lights, lots of noises. It's different from the gym setting. And because you're not accustomed to that, 
uh, qu- quite often you, you're, it will sort of tantalize your senses and it will make you feel uh, out of your element. When, whereas you go into the gym, you know, you have home ice advantage. It's a hockey term. Sorry, I'm Canadian. You have home ice advantage and you, and you, uh, you feel comfortable. As soon as you go to your, your, the gym, it's, a, it's almost like you're in a familiar place with uh, friends and family. And it can be very, very comfortable to roll in a gym situation um, and very uncomfortable to go to a place in a different city or a different country and compete against people you've never even uh, seen before, right? Different styles, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> it's an illusion. Competition is an illusion. And when you remove the illusion from the act of just doing jujitsu, which is what you would probably be doing every day if you're serious about jujitsu, you start to see that uh, it's just you and another man or woman and um, the same go- the same goals apply take them down, put them in a defensive cycle or uh, pull guard, sweep them, get into a, get them into a defensive cycle, I should say, <clears throat> and look for the finish or, you know, get up on the scoreboard or wh- however you like to compete. It's the same thing as if you're in the gym, but we're just in a different environment. Um, we have to also discuss, especially when we're talking about comparing rolling in the gym versus rolling in a competition, we have to discuss the difference between practice performance and competition performance. So this is a really important concept. Practice performance, it depends on your goal. Your goal in practice could be to win. Let's say you're preparing for a competition, a big competition is coming up. Yes, you want to win. You want to be successful in the, in the gym. You want to play to those rules that you're going to be experiencing in the competition. Um, You know, you could even take it as far as if you know there's people in your division or maybe you have a super fight coming up and you know who those people are going to be. You know what their styles are going to be. You know what their body types are going to be. You could try to get people to mimic those styles and those body types. Whatever you're going to be competing for, you want to tailor your training to sort of simulate that situation. And sometimes the goal will be to win. You want to win your rounds. You want to get your scores. That's very, very important if you're preparing for competition. However, there's going to be time where you're not preparing for competition, usually a couple months out of the year. um, And the goal is not going to be to win. The goal is going to be to learn. Okay. And I I recommend that any competitor takes a couple months out of the year um, to sort of regroup and try and develop new skills rather than getting ready for competition, because this will give you a chance, first of all, to get hungry for competition again, but also it will give you a chance to work on things that you wouldn't normally want to use in competition. Uh, competition performance is almost always based around winning. Super important to understand if you're not winning in competition, why are you doing it? Now, there are some guys who are at the highest level and they have so much confidence in, in competition that they will try to just play with new things in competition. Oh, I'm usually a guard puller, but I wanted to try my stand up game. Um, you know, I wanted to see if I could go and get my legs entangled and see if I how my leg lock defense would work against somebody like really at the high level of the sport. There are guys who do stuff like this, but most of the time we jump into a competition. Most competitors are just trying to get the win by any means. So uh, competition performance usually based around winning, but practice performance usually based around either preparing to win or learning. And when you're learning things, your practice performance, it's natural that your practice performance will suffer. It is okay to have poor practice performance from time to time when learning new things. That is so important to understand. Don't go in there and try and do lapel guards when you've never played lapel guards and uh, you're getting your guard passed, you're getting smashed chest to chest and and you're just like, fuck, I suck. Like this, this is horrible. Guys, um, you're, you're going to get crushed when you try new things. This is just the nature of developing those new motor skills, developing the new uh, abilities and the new guards and the new positions that you're not used to, your body's not used to it. You're going to get fucked up from time to time. And that's okay. Do not mistake poor practice performance for a lack of, uh, skill or ability. It's all part of the learning process. So it's normal to get fucked up when you're trying new things. Um, okay. Confidence comes from like knowledge of understanding uh, the material that you're, uh, it, well, we could talk about like public speaking or podcasting. Even, um, if you understand the material you're talking about, confidence is very, very easy. If, uh, if you don't understand what you're talking about, we're, we're using public speaking as an example here. If you don't understand what you're talking about, public speaking is going to be a fucking nightmare. It's going to be, uh, nerve wracking. A lot of people, 
really fear public speaking. I actually, uh, I love public speaking. I actually get excited about it. Like if someone were to be like, Hey Matt, I want you to go talk to 200 people about starting a business or Hey Matt, I want you to talk to 200 people about like cooking, or I want you to talk to, uh, 200 people about, uh, jujitsu, whatever teaching kids. Like I would j- love that. Would I get a little bit nervous before? Yes but I would have a confidence within me to know the material. It's same thing when you go into a competition. If you know good jujitsu and you really believe in your training and your, your knowledge and your ability, you can go in there and really have the confidence to do what you want to do. Same thing with public speaking. If you understand the material you're talking about, you're going to probably do quite well. Um, You can just riff, you can just freestyle, uh, that, that just like talking in front, uh, in front of a camera for an hour a week on this podcast, it's like, I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't legitimately understand, um, the information. I want to talk about episodes 13 and 14 of the essential jiu-jitsu podcast, which were based on the history of jiu-jitsu. And, uh, also, uh, another historical episode I did was episode three, which is on Kimura. These are more history based, um, podcasts and they took me a lot of work, a lot of preparation. I recorded them and I, I, uh, I had to redo them a couple times because I didn't like how I was delivering the content. And the reason why is because it's very fact and date based. And, uh, it was a lot of information that was new information to me. And so when I tried to deliver it, it almost seemed like I was regurgitating rather than fully understanding the information. And if you don't fully understand the information that it's going to come across, like you're regurgitating something as opposed to me, just like talking to a camera and riffing. So still, I recommend you guys check out those episodes. I, 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 uh, I, I thought they turned out really good. Um, but those, when it's, when you have to in- involve new information, it's going to be difficult. You know, it's going to take time for that information to settle in and just become part of you and just become part of, uh, just become second nature to you. Like I said, imagine, Imagine doing like a speech on a particular topic and you don't actually know that topic. You're just trying to like regurgitate things that you have uh, uh, read in a textbook. It's it's going to be a nightmare. It's not going to be fun. You're going you're gonna to be it's going to be nerve wracking for you. And the same thing in jujitsu competition. You go into a competition and you, you you know that you've been slacking or you know that you're uh, you, you know deep down that your skills aren't where they should be compared to other people in your division. Um, you're not going to go in with confidence. You're not going to you're not going to believe that you can win. If you know you suck at jujitsu and your training environment isn't good, it's going to be difficult to go into competitions. I remember, uh, again, I'll mention Lex Friedman had John Danaher on his podcast. I I, I love those episodes. I love I love listening to Danaher talk. He's such an interesting guy. He was talking about uh, well, Lex Friedman was was asking him, hey, uh, they were watching Gordon versus Nikki at the last ADCC. And he was saying. Uh, he was asking Gordon about confidence. He was asking Gordon about, you know, do you think, or asking Dan her, do you, do you think that Gordon was nervous going into this finals versus Nikki Rod? Uh, don't you think Nikki Rod has a chance? Blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, don't you think Nikki Rod believes he can win? And then Dan is like, well, he would, he would remember the training sessions. They would both remember the training sessions when Gordon would absolutely destroy Nikki Rod. And it would be difficult for Nikki Rod to trick himself into believing that how that his uh, competition performance is somehow going to be different. Um, and, and it would be difficult for Gordon to not remember those training sessions when he had so much success versus Nikki Rod in the training sessions. So he can carry that success, his, his, his knowledge of the success that he had versus this v- same guy into the competition and have confidence in his techniques, knowing that his techniques have worked on him before um, and they could work again. So I thought that that was a really, really interesting, uh, uh, a really interesting thing that Danaher said. I can't remember what episode that was, but definitely just, you know, type in Danaher, Lex Friedman on Spotify and a great podcast. He's been on there a couple of times. Um, let's talk about how a lack of confidence can create negative performance. And it's pretty self-explanatory, but we'll just go over it. You can become hesitant uh, or, or kind of afraid, I guess is, is a better word of what your opponent will do to you. 
because you lack the confidence to escape bad positions. Maybe you have a fear of getting pinned. You know, deep down your pin escapes aren't good, or, you know, deep down your back defense isn't good. You know that, uh, you're really bad at defending submissions or you don't put yourself in submissions often. You're really bad at defending legs. Guys who are still not on the leg lock train. Uh, they know that if they get leg entangled, they have no way to get out. This is, uh, terrible. You don't want to go into a competition like that. Um, I think the remedy for that is to educate yourself and to put yourself in these bad positions in training and try to uh, get success in training. But uh, if you lack that confidence in those positions, in those deep defensive cycles, you will be hesitant. You will be uh, tentative. You will, you'll be cagey. You won't be going in and engaging and being the aggressor and, and insisting the offensive cycle. A lot of time you can, uh, it, it, the result will be, you will hang back and you will, do less of what you potentially could do because you uh, fear what your opponent could do to you. Um, if you have, if you lack the confidence to do certain techniques, you won't even go for them. So if you're going with someone and you you have an opportunity to shoot a triangle or whatever, but you know that your triangles are lacking um, and you haven't had success with those moves, then it's going to be difficult to, to go for that move because you know that Hey, I don't, I don't believe that I can finish this triangle, right? I don't, I don't have the belief that I can finish this and, and complete the mission, get the submission, whatever. Um, if you feel like you're going against a really, really well-known guard player and their guard retention is fantastic, super dangerous guard, you're going to be cagey approaching that guard. And the result is you're not going to come forward enough. Uh, you're going to be playing too reserved, too conservative, and your opponent will take advantage of this. Like I, I tell my students, if your opponent doesn't fear a threat of, of from any position, if they, if they don't feel threatened, if they feel comfortable, they're going to immediately take the lead. They're going to go into an offensive cycle as they should. So you have to always make your opponent feel uncomfortable through Kazushi, through pressure, whatever, um, making sure that your opponent feels uncomfortable. One of my students just competed and he had mentioned that, uh, he, he he had a uh, mixed results on the day and he, he lost his last match and he said he held back because he had a fear of uh, gassing out. And he asked me, what should I do? Should I go on the Airdyne bike and do more rounds and like build that confidence in my cardio? And I, I said, yeah, that's, you know, doing, doing hellish rounds on the Airdyne bike is a good way to build cardio. And uh, I'm not going to lie. I do have more confidence going into a competition when I've been suffering and training more, when I've been when I've really been doing my conditioning work, when I'm putting it, when I'm putting in the time on the bike, putting myself through struggle and discomfort, uh, quite quite often I can go into a competition knowing that I have that. But I don't necessarily believe that paints the whole picture. I don't think that um, you know having that fear of gassing out. I think that is because uh, this guy's got good cardio. You know, I I don't think that that fear does come from an actual. Uh, a weakness in his cardiovascular uh, ability. I think it's more of a mental thing, right? It believe, not believing in yourself to get into the offensive cycle uh, and and just f focusing again on what they're going to do to you. That is not the mindset that a competitor should have. It's a losing mindset, quite honestly. You want to go in there and really believe that you can impose the offensive cycle. And once you get to that offensive cycle, you should try and ride it as long as you can. You should try and sometimes you should just hold positions sometimes as long as you can rather than going in and trying to get to the, um, trying to get to the end result, which might be like a guard pass or a back take or a submission. Sometimes jujitsu is so much about just holding. I've been playing a lot of chess lately and, uh, I've realized that chess a lot of the time is not just about clearing out the other the other team's uh, men. It's not just about uh, taking their pieces off the chessboard and getting checkmates and things like that. But a lot of the game is just, it, it's wearing each other down and trying to gain the, the tempo or the offensive cycle and just getting positioned on the board in such a way that your opponent can't even move. And, it, and this exact same concept is, is uh, it, it's in jujitsu. Sometimes we just want to get into positions and just hold so that our opponent can't make moves rather than us making the result to be the end result, the, the pass, sweep, submission, whatever, the end result should be get into the offensive cycle and constantly put pressure on our opponents so that they feel uncomfortable. Um, hopefully that makes sense, right? So, so just to round everything off, 
<clears throat> the fear of gassing out in competition is a common thing for competitors. Again, you have to have that belief that even in the worst positions, even when the chips are down <clears throat> and you're down on the scoreboard and you're in a horrible position or you're in a submission that you've put yourself yourself through those situations in the training room and you've you've uh, reliably repeatedly consistently gotten yourself out and gotten into the offensive cycle and i think that the so much of your training especially for competitors so much of your training should be based around that how do we get into the offensive cycle how do we how do we enjoy the offensive cycle for as long as we can and how do we make our opponent feel uncomfortable for as long as we possibly can if you know deep down that you haven't done the work, you haven't done any extra uh, conditioning, um, or you haven't put yourself into bad positions and in training intentionally and worked your way out, you're, you, you will go into competition and doubt yourself. So it's very important to go into competition well-prepared, putting yourself in horrible positions, um, suffering, <laughs> you know, and like I said, you're, when you put yourself in these horrible positions, these pins, you put yourself into submissions, you're going to get tapped out. You're going to get your guard passed. It's going to happen. It's part of it. Don't avoid it in competition. When you're trying to develop skills and learn and grow, that's part of the growing process. That way you get to see the mistakes that you don't want to make in competition. All right, let's talk about managing nerves. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is one of the most common things that I'm asked as a competitor. Matt, how do I manage my nerves in a competition? When I go into a competition, my I get an adrenaline dump. How do I stop this from happening? Um, the long and short of it is you can't. <laughs> you can't really stop it from happening. You can just become more comfortable with it and you can become more accustomed to it and more conditioned to it. Uh, in, my, in my episode with Josh McKinney, you know, I was asking him about this sort of the same thing and his response was great. He said, be present, right? So think about, think about this. It's game day. It's, it's time to go to the venue. You shouldn't be using extra energy worrying about your matches. You should be focusing on the moment. Okay. I wake up. Maybe you need to weigh in. Maybe you don't. Uh, if you can have some water, uh, do a stretch, whatever you like to do, relax, you know, watch a show. Um, do not spend the whole morning worrying about the competition. That is energy that should be applied during your match. When you're uh, worried about your, your weigh in or whatever, D don't work, uh, don't concern yourself with it. Don't warm up excessively. And then you go in, you're all exhausted. Don't stress about making weight. If you're on weight, you're on weight. And when it's time to make it weight, you're going to make weight. When it's time to warm up, you're going to warm up. You don't need to, uh, overcomplicate things or over concern yourself with things that are out of your control. Only focus on what is within your control and only uh, focus on the present. Do not be concerned about what this could happen. That can happen. Uh, people are going to know I lost, blah, blah, blah. What if I don't win? Like these are, this is not a good mindset. The mindset is when it's time to get ready, I'm going to get ready. When it's time to warm up, I'm going to warm up. When it's time to walk out on the mats, I'm going to walk out on the mats and I'm just going to absorb and live in the pressure and uh, absorb the feeling of all that pressure on top of me and just understand that it is a part of competition. And that's just what it is. Um, don't worry about what others think about your performance. Don't worry about what the, what your friends and family are going to think if you don't win, because now you are, uh, you're measuring your worth with the opinions of others. And that's not what this is about. Um, wins don't define you, uh, unless you're like one of these autistic people who's like absolutely obsessed with winning. An example of this is Ronda Rousey. If you ever listen to, or if you ever read Ronda Rousey's book, she talks about how, you know, she, when she would compete in, in judo, she would uh, cry like after every competition. Um, I can, I can count one or two times I've cried in competition. One time's because I bust, busted my knee badly. And the other time was because, uh, uh, I, I just lost to Bruno Frazado in Las Vegas. And it wasn't a cry of sadness. It was actually just like an overwhelming emotion where I was just like, Whoa, like that was so crazy going against a legend like that, having this like uh, Cinderella day where I was, I had four submissions and I was just on fire and then like you lose and it was just, it just overcame me, right? Like I didn't cry because I lost. I cried because it was just so overwhelming. The emotion that I had, I had, uh, the calories that I had burned that day, uh, investing my mind in the competition and after it just like, woof, it was like a, 
It was like a blanket had been lifted and also a weight had been put on all at the same time. It was very, very hard to describe. But um, if you worry about what others think and if you define yourself with uh, with wins in tournaments, I think that that's I think that's almost an uh, an unhealthy mindset. Maybe just call me a loser. <laughs> uh, that could be true. I'm sure there's competitors out there being like, dude, that's why you haven't won anything. Um, you know, you don't know what it's like to to win the worlds or whatever. And that's true. I probably never will. But at the same time, for me, wins don't define me. Uh, it, uh, t- winning a tournament is not the pinnacle of my jujitsu journey. I'm fortunate enough that I get to influence a lot of people with with uh, what I do in the podcast and 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 through the gym. I get to work with kids. I get to work with women. I get to work with beginners and and competitors. It's such a great life. So like for me, I, this is all gravy for me. When I go into a competition, it's like win or loss. That's the, that that tournament does not define me. Plus, I'm going against the uh, the best that I possibly can. So, you know, it's it's rare uh, or, or it, I'm not going to say not expected to win at the highest levels, but it's it's unlikely when you're jumping into like ADCC trials and black belt divisions and stuff. It's it's uh, harder to win these divisions. OK, than the colored belt divisions. Uh, make sure that you're trusting in your training. So if you're if you want to manage your nerves, think back to all the hard work you put in, in the gym. Incredibly important. If you're not working hard in the gym and building the, uh, the confidence as we previously discussed, yeah, you're not, you're not going to have trust in your training and it's going to be difficult to cultivate confidence in the training room. Also remember your opponent is nervous. Everyone goes through this. It's natural when you, uh, uh, when you're going through that fight or flight response in your brain and, um, you know, your brain is sending signals to your body on, on, you know, minutes before you're about to fight. Like, yeah, everyone's fucking nervous, dude. Everyone uh, is feeling shaky. Everyone is trying to cope with those feelings the best that they possibly can. Everyone has been uh, working very hard in the gym and trying to now reproduce the successes that they had in the gym on the competition mats. That isn't easy. And everyone is feeling that stress. So just understand that what you're feeling is not just um, it's not just in your head. Everyone is feeling that and that's normal. And it's better to, in, instead of trying to sweep that feeling under the rug, I find it's better to just sit with it and kind of just appreciate how it makes you feel alive, right? If if this is the last competition you're going to do, you know, look at it and be like, hey, at least I competed. At least I at least I stepped up and, and tested myself uh, when so many other people in life never get a chance to do that. OK, it, it gives you a feeling of being alive. I might get hurt, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, the highs are high and the lows are incredibly low. But at least you put it on the line. At least you tried. You can never look back and say, well, at least, you know, uh, I, sh- I should have tried to do that. I should have I should have tried to compete more. It's like, yeah, you did it. And um, that's that's what living is. Right. Uh, another thing that's really helped me just as a side note in a, in a physical sense is breath work. So I think breath work is incredibly important, especially uh, in day to day life. I, I like I like to do the Wim Hof breathing and everything like that. I find it very beneficial. But in competition, when you're um uh, and preparing for competition as well. I don't know about you guys out there, but sometimes when I know a, a competition is just around the corner and I start thinking about it, my heartbeat starts increasing. Uh, it starts racing and I, and I, I feel nervous. I start to feel like, Oh shit, like shit's about to get real. You know what I mean? Like, um, uh, how do, how do I deal with this horrible nervous feeling in my chest? And it's hard for me to breathe. A lot of the time I take a deep breath and then I exhale. <sighs> And I do this a couple of times and right away I notice after a couple of breaths, I start to calm myself down and I just remind myself when it's time to warm up, I'm going to warm up when it's time to step on the mats, I'm going to step on the mats and I'm just going to do my best and I'm just going to live in the moment and try and just get the job done. However, uh, however I can, right? I don't, I don't usually go into a competition with a lack of confidence because, um, I, I train hard and I, I study hard and I train every day. And I train with good guys. So I, I, I'm pretty confident in my uh, abilities, but everyone is, is confident in their abilities. And then it, be, it comes down to who can play the rules better. You know, who, who's got the better cardio, who, who has more belief and more confidence in their abilities. Um, you know, who's more athletic. It's just so many factors that can come into play at the highest level. And, and uh, sometimes it can just be like a game of millimeters, right? Or inches for you Americans. Okay. Um, Competition experience is pretty critical to get accustomed to this feeling. If you don't compete a lot, like we're going to talk about now about uh, coming back from injuries and ring rust. If you don't compete a lot 
and then you try and jump in the competition uh, scene, it, it's difficult. And it takes time to develop those skills as a competitor. Like I said, it's all an illusion. You go out there, you're doing exactly what you would be doing in the training room. Just doing jujitsu. It's just you and one other person. Maybe the mats feel different. Um, maybe the rules are, are different. Maybe there's medals on the line or people are watching, whatever. It's all just jujitsu. So if, if, if an athlete's coming back from an injury or, or they haven't fought in a while, whatever, um, this is a part of almost every athlete's journey. Every athlete comes back from injuries and things like that. They take time off, they come back and you know, they they don't have that same management of stress. They, um, Maybe their cardio is lacking a little bit. Maybe they're a little bit unsure of whether or not their knee will hold up. Like I just went through that uh, this year, uh, coming back from a meniscus surgery. And, um, you know, I put the time in and uh, my physio and my knee held up. So every athlete's going to go through this. It's never comfortable to return to competition, especially when you've you've gone over lay, uh, taking time off or for injuries or for whatever reason. It's never comfortable. Um I would say don't return prematurely. If you're injured, I think one of the biggest mistakes, especially if you go through like a surgery, one of the biggest mistakes people do is they uh, they they come back prematurely. And now they're coming back, their body's not healed. There's a greater chance of re-injury, especially for things like meniscus tears, uh, tor- torn ligaments in the knees, things like that. You come back early when you're not fully healed just for the sake of competing. I don't think it's worth it at all. I think it's, uh, I prioritize longevity. I pr- prioritize health. I think it's way more valuable to be able to keep training on a fully uh, with your body functional as opposed to like maybe trying to win this tournament this year. There's always going to be more tournaments. For me, it's n- it never makes sense to put your health at risk just to win a tournament, especially when you're blatantly injured or when you just had surgery. Uh, like I, I listened to Dan Henderson on Joe Rogan's podcast and he's talking about how he fought two months after an ACL surgery. That's fucking insane. Like, um, I couldn't even imagine ACL. Usually you're out for like a year, you know, and, and you got to rehab it and everything. You got to get past mental barriers to be able to use your knee the way it uh, was to come back from an ACL replacement after two months. I, I mean, I almost don't even know if you, if it's true, uh, it's such a high chance of, of, uh, an injury. And I believe he won that fight with a knockout. Right. So, um, yeah, I would, I would never come back prematurely. I would always listen to my, listen to my professionals, uh, physiotherapists and, and really put in the time and let my body heal before returning to sport. I think that's really, really important. Um, when you are coming back and you feel like you're ready to do it, you have to simulate the competition experience in the training room. So by creating this simulation, you try to mimic the competition, uh, the variables as much as you possibly can. Things like rule set, time restraints, athletes trying to stall on you, trying to play the rules against you, different styles, different body types, etc. So many different variables. Um, stresses, you know, like, oh, uh, playing, playing constraint-led games where you are down points and you need to score things like this, or, uh, your opponent is up points and he is stalling on you and you're trying to now work against a stalling opponent. These are all things that are very, very likely to happen at the highest level in competition. And so, uh, simulating these variables in training and trying to mimic the same feelings, the same fatigue, even jumping on the air bike and then going in exhausted or doing shark tank rounds where you're, you're forced to fight, uh, under, uh, under these variables while you're exhausted, um, is all very, very good for competition training. It sucks. It's not fun. And you're sure to experience some poor practice performance. But that being said, um, it is a, a very beneficial way to come back and to sort of get yourself feeling those same, um, competition, uh, vibes and adrenaline dumps. Make sure after you compete too that you make necessary adjustments after your turn. Like I said, when I returned from my knee surgery, I did a grappling industries and the I, man, I remember the I had nine matches that day and I won them all. I won three golds that day, uh, and I, I remember um, uh, the first match. Man, I felt so rough. I had a good warm up and everything too. Uh, and, and when I went in the first match, I was like, man, like I, I had just won on points. And after that match, for me, the first match is always, I find the hardest. And I've had a lot of competitors tell me the same thing, but I remember finishing that match and just being like, man, I got to get my breath back. I'm so exhausted. Like that, that did not go the way I wanted to. <laughs> I, I, I just won by like a sweep or something. I'm like, fuck, that wasn't dominant. That wasn't uh, a submission. It wasn't really how I envisioned my return. This is going to be hard. And uh, it's important to try and make 
necessary adjustments when you after you re, uh, do return. So I look back and I'm like, what could I have done differently? How did my mindset change uh, from that and the next tournament and the next tournament, blah, blah, blah. And as I kept returning to competitions, I, I felt more and more comfortable in that first match, right? I felt more... Um, uh, I, I felt more prepared. And after the match, I felt more fresh. I didn't feel as exhausted because I didn't have this crazy, uh, adrenaline dump. Okay. Now I think we should talk about imposter syndrome. Uh, this is a, it's, it's, it's a phenomenon where, uh, it's a condition where basically people doubt their accomplishments and their skills. They have a fear of, uh, a fear of being exposed as a fraud, or they believe that the accomplishments and the skills that they have were achieved through luck sometimes. Um, and they also feel like maybe they have fooled people to, uh, they fooled them into believing that they're, uh, that they're actually, that you're better than you are. Okay. Um, imposter syndrome is <laughs> it, it, just understand that if you have imposter syndrome, it kind of shows you're not an imposter. Okay. If you have the self-awareness and the wherewithal to know that like, Hey, like, uh, am I as good as I think I am? Like I'm doubting myself. Uh, if you think like that, I would say most imposters don't think like that. Most imposters generally think they're the shit. Okay. <laughs> they think their ability is, um, much greater than what they, th or their knowledge is much greater than what they think it is. Check out the Dunning Kruger effect. Uh, th this is something called the imposter cycle. It happens when you're starting a task, uh, e either with like over preparation or maybe you're, tr you, you've procrastinated and now you're trying to cram, uh, you're frantically trying to get, uh, get prepared for this task. And when you finish the task, you feel like, uh, you feel relieved. You feel, uh, uh, a sense of relief. And then the cycle starts all over again. Um, when a new task comes along and it triggers those feelings of anxiety and doubt. I remember I used to have this in cooking as well, when it was time to like prepare for a banquet or whatever, or prepare for a cooking competition, you'd be like, man, am I like good enough to do this? And like, you're trying, you're, you're really trying to meticulously plan everything and you get super stressed out and you start doubting yourself. And then after the competition or after the uh, banquet or whatever it is you're doing, I, I'd be like, okay, like it's over. Oh, I could do it. Oh, interesting. You know, it was all just in my head. So this is the imposter cycle. And, um, <clears throat> uh, I would say the ways to deal with imposter syndrome, if this is something that resonates with you, know your own value, right? Like really try and separate reality from your emotions. Your emotions are telling you, that you are secretly an imposter, that you might be fraudulent in some way, that people are fooled into thinking that you're uh, better than you are. Um, make sure that you can separate those emotions from what reality is. You know, do you have a successful Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Academy? Have you won, <clears throat> have you won tournaments uh, before the highest level or at your level? Do you have success against people in your gym and in your area at the same uh, division? These are all things that are reality, okay? Um, and your emotions telling you that you might not be worth, uh, you're, that you might not be as good as as you think you are. You have to separate yourself from that and look at the the hard facts. What are your accomplishments? What have you uh, achieved? And just understand that results do not define your value. Like I said earlier, winning tournaments doesn't define your value as a jujitsu practitioner or as a human being. Okay. There's more to life than winning tournaments, guys. Even for the, even for the, you know, the diehard competitors, this is what you do in life. I have to say there's more to life than just winning championships. I'm sorry. Um, I would say to deal with this imposter syndrome, prioritize daily habits rather than uh, the end goal, right? Don't make your you know, you got a competition coming up in two months. Don't be like, okay, I got to win this competition. I really have to win this competition. I got, I, if I don't win this competition, everyone's going to think I'm a fraud or blah, 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 blah. No, don't think like that. Think like, okay, what can I do today to make myself more prepared for that competition tomorrow? What can I do today to make myself more prepared, repaired, et cetera, et cetera. Can I study tape? Can I, am I doing all that I can? Can I keep myself safe in training? Can I do the extra work? Can I put myself in bad positions? Can I prioritize the rule set while I'm trained? There's so many things we can do day to day to build habits that will yield good results. Another thing people do is they go into a competition and they think about the, the finals match. Oh, if I get to the finals, I'm likely to meet this person and they have this game. So I need to watch out for this, uh, this game. 
Um, the truth is you should just be focusing about your, your next fight. You uh, don't look past any opponents. Even if you feel like there's no way I'm going to lose to this guy and I'm going to look past him. That is such a dangerous thing to do. Take it one fight at a time and make sure that you're focusing on the task at hand, uh, that your, your next fight. And after your fight, recover, get ready to go again and repeat, right? Until, until you're in the finals and, and now we're trying, now we're trying to win the gold medal match. So don't prioritize the end goal, prioritize daily habits that lead up to that end goal. Also, stop comparing yourself to others. When you have an imposter syndrome, don't look at someone who's in your field. Don't look at your peers and say, I should be as successful as them. I should have as much money as them. I should have as many students as them. Um, you know, <laughs> I should have as many podcast subscriptions as them, blah, blah, blah. Th things like that. Don't pr compare yourself to others. Look at yourself. Uh, look at your own achievements, your own skills. Talk to your friends and close people that you, that are in your life about your abilities and your achievements that usually will, uh, kind of reinforce what you've accomplished. If you have students saying, Hey, you know what, Matt, like, uh, you've really done a lot for me or, or you've done a lot for my son. He, the other day he, uh, he was bullied and he double legged, uh, this, the bully and he took them down and held them in mounted position. And the bully started crying. This is a true story has happened. And when I hear that, I'm like, man, like, that's making a fucking difference. You know what I mean? That is like taking a kid who was getting picked on and now you're giving the, that kid the tools and the skills needed to defend themselves. That's a priceless thing. Nobody can put a price on that. And when you hear that, that just like reinforces your ability as an instructor, reinforces your, uh, your vision and your mission at the gym and what you're trying to achieve changing people's life through jujitsu. So when you hear things like that, that, that kind of reinforces to me what I'm doing correctly. And I've, I've suffered from imposter syndrome through cooking. I've done it through, uh, the podcast. I've done it through, uh, my ability as a competitor. So an itchy nose right now. So it's very, very easy to fall into this trap. But like, I, like I said, the very fact that you have imposter syndrome often will show that you are not an imposter. Okay. Um, another thing is just to recognize when you, when you have the traits of imposter syndrome so that you can look out for that and make sure that, um, if you do have it, that you can remove the emotion from the reality and say, Hey, like, I feel like this may be imposter syndrome. Be aware of that. The more aware you are of yourself, the easier it will be to, um, to sort of remove yourself from it, to accept it and to move on rather than, to, rather than to let it weigh you down and to make you freaked out every single time you got to go and uh, teach a class. I remember, um, I remember when I first started teaching kids, I had imposter syndrome for sure. It would, it would be fucking stressful going to the gym every day because I was like, man, like there's going to be parents watching me. Um, there's going to be kids that I've got to deal with. And at this point, I think the imposter syndrome didn't come from my lack of ability in jujitsu, but more my, just my lack of experience teaching children. I didn't know how to convey information to them. I didn't know what would be the best training practices. I didn't know how to deal with kids if they got injured or hurt or they started crying or uh, I didn't know how to deal with with parents who um, got upset when their kid loses, blah, blah, blah. And over time, after I developed enough experience, just day in, day out, working with kids, seeing how they learn, seeing, um, you know, the struggles that they go through and just seeing how they behave. I got more and more experience. And now when I go to kids class, it's not as stressful for me. I don't worry about, am I going to be exposed as a fraud? I don't worry about, am, are my abilities good enough because I've put in enough time in doing it and uh, I've seen results with my kids in competition. So I'm, I'm, you know, pretty confident in teaching kids now. That's just my, one of my experiences with imposter syndrome. And just remember every, uh, if you feel like an imposter on the mats, with your abilities. Remember every day on the mats, uh, your performance in training will remind you of your ability. The mats do not lie. That is one of the most beautiful things about jujitsu is the mats do not lie. You are, uh, th there is no, uh, patterns or board breaking in what we do. What we do is, is one person trying to fight another person and the better grappler, the more confident grappler usually wins. And there's no way to get around that. There's no way to hide. If you're uh, a fake black belt, like you've promoted yourself to a belt that you didn't earn, it will be exposed. If you're a shitty black belt and you go roll with a blue belt and get you get tuned up, you're going to be exposed. You're going to know right away. You're going to have that immediate feedback um, in this sport. And that is one of the most beautiful things about jujitsu. The mats do not lie. 
So guys, that's all I'm going to say about confidence. I hope there were some insightful takeaways from this episode. Guys, if you are enjoying the content I'm putting out, please look in the links below to support the show. Get a sweet EJJP hat or a mug. There's lots of good stuff on there. There's sweaters, hoodies, t-shirts, uh, women's shirts, lots of great stuff there on the online store. Again, link in the bottom. If you really want to support the show on a more sustainable level, please subscribe to the online academy, the on guard online academy. Um, I put out content almost every single day. Also, feel free to message me, guys. The contacts are in the bottom. Uh, if you have questions or ideas for show uh, topics, I would love to hear it. I'd love to hear from you guys. Otherwise, just like, share, smash a subscribe, uh, subscribe, and leave comments below because it really helps my algorithm and it starts discussions, which I really, really like. Other than that, you guys, I'm going to leave you now. Remember, the Essential Jiu-Jitsu Podcast is everything you need to know about jiu-jitsu. Hope you enjoyed the show. Take care. We'll see you next time. Bye.